frequency. So it's been really nice hearing how R uh, came to be with the focus on classifying and interpreting aerial photos. And if I'm honest, it was this side of things that really got me into aerial archaeology. Um, and this presentation kind of takes a look at my path into aerial archaeology and how the changes of the pandemic kind of created an opportunity to overcome some of my disabilities. So if we're going to use a fancy word like neurodiversity, I suppose I should probably explain it first. Um, one of the best explanations that I've seen comes from a Harvard Medical School article, which basically states that it's the idea that everybody experiences and interacts with the world around them in different ways. There isn't a right way of thinking, learning and behaving. And these different experiences are grouped into conditions that we know like dyslexia, OCD, autism. Um, and I really like this definition because it says they aren't deficits. And while I will, I will put my hands up and say I do lack certain social skills uh, and I do get overwhelmed in certain situations, um, they do also provide us with some really unique facets. And I think they're really good in aerial archaeology in particular. Uh, for example, often interested in niche subjects. What is, I mean, yeah, what else is aerial archaeology if not a niche subject? Um, we're highly perceptive to visual detail. What more do we need when you're looking at aerial photos and LIDAR? Um, never mind having to sit for hours sifting through photos. I mean, we we would get bored otherwise but if it's something we're really interested in we could i could sit there for hours and hours forgetting to eat drink not quite so good in the end sitting there shaking and never mind but primarily one of the things i wanted to pull attention to which is quite interesting given what rebecca's just mentioned in her presentation about the separation between what she, educational systems can give you in terms of skills and what you can learn commercially and how aerial archaeology is a much more learned through experience rather than through an educational system is the fact that many of us with these conditions struggle in academia we get so far and our brains don't fit in the boxes that the education system want us to work within so many of us decide like myself to leave because we know we wouldn't be able to do very well So, how did I get into aerial archaeology? Well, it kind of happened by fluke, if I'm honest. Um, in line with the science session title, uh, a little journey into aerial archaeology. I was obsessed with Egyptology as a kid. I still am. Um, but I collected everything that I could find, from the horrible histories books, teaching myself how to read hieroglyphs when I was a kid, even through to Where's Waldo. I did it all. And if you can spot him, let me know. Um, I haven't got anything to give you, but, you know, you'll get a hug. Um, but I wanted to discover something new. That was why I got into aerial archaeology in the end, and archaeology in general. I studied archaeology at college. I was one of the last people in the UK to do the A-level of archaeology before it was de deemed unnecessary and not really enough pickup. Um, it was during this time I was diagnosed with dyslexia, dyscalculia and autism, which means that I'm not good with people, I'm not good at spelling and I don't remember numbers. So let's go into a career which has a lot of dates, a lot of weird spellings. I mean, luckily most of the people are dead. While I was studying archaeology, I was lucky enough to work for a local unit and my... I know we all say archaeology is a small world, but my, uh, my lecturer here used to work for the same company. Um, now, I ended up actually uh, staying there for 10 years, in which I basically did everything from digging, illustrations, and towards the end of it, I was actually lucky enough to be taught GIS and LiDAR processing by Rebecca. Um, I was given a 30 minute handover on how to use GIS before the last user left and was kind of left to go, here you go, good luck. Um, I did push the envelope a little bit further, luckily. Um, so 
in hindsight, they're all jobs that didn't require me to be able to spell properly. It was through this that I met Chris Cox, and she was doing AP interpretation for us. I was processing her LIDAR for us. We kind of stuck to what we were good at doing. Um, and when it got to a point that she was looking for somebody to manage her GIS work, her data, I was like, pick me, pick me, I'll do it. Uh, I kind of realized I got as far as I could go, and I wanted a slight change of direction. And I thought, why not? jump into aerial archaeology and by that extent I was really lucky to be taught AP interpretation by both Chris and by Rog and it's a shame that Rog isn't here because that would have been would have been nice to sort of say thank you to him for doing that uh, but it was because of that I was able to join my colleagues uh, into the Historic England Archive analysis bleh, providing analysis on aerial photos and it was actually that that really grabbed my attention more than doing the LIDAR. So these were the first two large projects that I worked on, uh, two high-speed rail projects, and um, this particular area alone. We looked at over 9,600 photos across the course of six months, and we had bespoke LIDAR capture, aerial imagery, hyperspectral photography, you name it, the company threw most things at it, apart from a decent sort of infrastructure of their own data. Between us, between the three of us doing most of the recording, we recorded 786 sites. But the most interesting part about it was that uh, of the three of us, two of us were dyslexic. Now, when things got really stressful, one of the things that actually got us through was the fact that two of us couldn't spell to save our lives. Uh, we had some, I mean, as I've put there, we, we worked together as a good team. So we checked each other's work. We made sure that if we weren't quite sure, we were like, what do you mean by this? But we did have some really good ones. For example, my favorite one, crap marks. Sorry, Rebecca, you shouldn't have taken a drink at that point. Uh, so we had crap marks, we had bound rays, we never really figured out quite what open cat minging was, but it does sound a bit painful. Uh, we started going into Tolkien territory with the Erethorp ditch, and I mean, we've all known some not quite so nice developers, but we ended up going into Orc territory with Golg. But as I say, luckily, we all knew what we were talking about. So at the end of the day, we were able to figure out and, you know, we got there in the end. But the problem was that takes us up to the last our conference in Constanta. Six months after that, the whole world changed. And unfortunately, so did my focus in archaeology. Um, one of our team members left. Then, thanks to going into lockdown, we all had to work remotely. And because of this, one of our team members also had to leave, which meant it left half a team. And because of access to archives being basically gone at that point, um, we kind of had to drift back to doing our own specialisms. Chris focused on the AP work that she could do, mostly using satellite imagery. And I ended up being on furlough for half of that year, if I'm honest. Um, but when I was needed for illustrations, for LIDAR processing, data management, I came back. But ultimately, I was working on things I had no connection to. And I kind of started to miss sitting in the archive. So when they opened back up and our workload started to really come back, uh, it kind of got beyond one person's capacity to do. So. I was a bit like, I could do it. I could do it. I miss doing it. Let me do it, please. Um, yeah, and I was nervous to get back into the archive. I hadn't looked at this point at aerial photos for a good, wow, a good year at least. And I thought, can I still remember this? It's been a while, but there I am sat in the archive and it took about half an hour and I was I was back to it. I was really lucky that we had a uh, mapping existing of the area that I was looking at, but by the end of it, I was actually able to add 
a lot more and actually tweak the locations of the mapping that we already received. By the second project, I was learning more and more. We had to do, uh, as was referenced by Cathy, some of the anti-glider ditches for World War II defences. But that's a tricky word, anti-glider ditches. Glidar, Gilder, Glyader. I couldn't spell glider to save my life. Um, and for the first time, I didn't have anybody to laugh about it with. I was working by myself with nobody to kind of lessen the fact that actually I can't spell. And for the first time, I really got to a point where it started to feel like a disability. In 2022, I took part in a neurodiversity panel for the UK's Chartered Institute for Archaeologists, and virtually all of us are dyslexic. Um, and many people have tried dictation or other methods of inputting data, and I thought, well, let's try dictation. Does it work? Okay, let me tell you now, it doesn't work in GIS. It's great in principle, but if I'm sat in an archive quietly and I'm yelling into a microphone, ditch, crop mark, doesn't really work, does it? Especially if there's confidentiality issues. So I am kind of got to the point where it wasn't really working. I ended up having to teach myself coding to try and streamline all of my workflows to buy myself back more time to check all of my spelling which is great if you know how to do it, but if you don't, you're still left with crap marks. So I ended up settling on shorthand. FS for field system, FB, field boundary, AGD for anti-glider ditch. The problem is I still had to go back and change it all when I got back to the office. So I was recording in the archive a lot quicker, but I still had to get it right. Aerial archaeology for me was becoming less about the interpretation, less about the discovery, and more about I can't do it, I can't record, I can interpret, I can't record. Now, one day late in 2022, I did what we've all done. I was on YouTube watching a video, watching a film trailer, and let's be honest, we've all done it. Half an hour later, we're on something completely different that we didn't mean to be watching, and we're like, how did I get here? But I was watching somebody review a game that I'd played on the PlayStation. They were playing it on PC, and they were using one of these. Now, I don't know how many people know what one of these is. So let me show you what my setup is literally a few months after doing that. These are programmable keypads. For every single key, I can assign a key, a function, a macro, an app, or most importantly, text strings. As long as I program it, I don't have to spell it correctly again. Now, you might think you've only got a couple of keys there. Well, the good thing is, for every single physical key that is here, there are actually six layers of digital keys behind it. Allowing for a couple of keys to toggle between the layers, I've now got approximately 150 keys that I can program. Now, I don't know if anybody here can think of 150 types of feature or evidence off the top of their head, but I can't. I mean, if I, you gave me time, I probably could, but I'm not going to be able to do that right off the top of my head. So what that means is that I was then able to do this. We record to the Forum on Information Standards and Heritage, or FISH, and we use their narrow types and broad types. So I program them to be close together so I can just do it quickly. So written for cultivation marks, field boundary, boundary, and um, ditch, ditch. Allowing for a tab to switch between fields and buttons to go between layers. It means that in the archive, in three buttons, I can record written furrow correctly, instead of all the various forms of cutlivation marks and macros and everything else that I would normally type. But the question is, 
having spent all that time, have I actually saved myself any time? And where does this actually lead? Well, on the next slide, you're going to see this process. But you're going to see the process of me using shorthand and the process of me having to type it all out. Now, if I was doing it manually, it will kick in, don't worry, I hope. There we go, right. So allowing for the fact that I've got typos in typing it out fully, using shorthand, using just a couple of letters to be able to program it, and just using one button to press and put all the information in. Now, as you can see, which one's already finished quicker? I still have to make the edits to using shorthand, and I haven't even finished typing it in manually. So in terms of speed, using shorthand sped me up by 35% on average. Using, uh, using the keypad comes up 65% quicker and 100% more accurate. I don't have to well worry about being able to not spell anymore. So why have I chosen to share this in particular? Well, the last nine months, I've tackled projects bigger than I've ever thought I'd be able to do by myself because I'm not worrying about my inability to spell and to record. There's such a focus on AI being able to help us identify sites and machine learning, but what about recording? What if you could level the playing field between everybody with just one button instead of having to type everything out? There I am in the archive just a couple of weeks ago with my little keypad, you can see just how small it really is. But that has sped up and eliminated. No, no, because I still have to type some things. Um, I can't put in full descriptions because they have to be unique to whatever I'm looking at. Um, now, that would be clever. If anybody can think of doing that, let me know. Um, but this means that my recording is 100% accurate per what I'm interpreting anyway. Um, and it turns out that by removing that focus and changing what I thought I couldn't do, I've actually been able to learn and interpret a hell of a lot more. I've been able to find, find um, banjo enclosures that had never been mapped fully, burial sites, been able to update and add features to mapping done by Historic England and mapping a Roman settlement that had never been mapped before. So it turns out that along the way, maybe I did discover a few things in the end. Now, as per the session title, wasn't me. Um, what is important about this? Well, we, I've covered the past and where I am now, but where does this go? Well, is it going to work? There we go. Let's see if this works. Anybody read that? Because I didn't. Uh, so, so I can tell you what I'm basically going to say. Um, yeah, I don't know either. But basically, let's not kid ourselves. Inputting data is not why we became archaeologists, but it's a necessary evil of the job. Now, in the course of three weeks of buying one of these little tiny boxes, I managed to bypass something that has been with me my whole life that was never a, actually visibly a disability until I was alone by myself having to record. Um, well, that was a redundant statement, wasn't it? Alone by myself. Um, but it resolved two years of being frustrated with my inability to record in the space of three weeks. Now, imagine if you could even that playing field for people who can't type very fast. Imagine somebody else who's dyslexic, who sits there going, I can't do this because I can't spell that correctly. We all know as part of GIS has become so integral in aerial photo interpretation that it has to be the same. Data has to be standard. There was a presentation at ARG in 2019 by Historic Environment Scotland, and they made the comment that they realized that they had huge volunteers 
putting in data and they actually then had to get them all to go all together and say this is what we need you to call it because we didn't quite realize we needed to get everybody to do it the same way we kind of thought oh you could if you give everybody one of those little tiny boxes everybody records identically you solve that problem before it even starts and at the end of the day it shifts the focus from inputting data, what our disabilities are, how our brains think, and puts the focus squarely back on what we all became archaeologists to do, interpret. And I think, there we go.